Welcome to my video on optimization. In this example, we have a man trying to find his way home. So here we have our man, which I drew as a stick figure, since I am such a great artist. And he's trying to find his way home. But the problem is that his house is on the other side of a river. So the question is, if the man can swim three kilometers per hour, and he can walk six kilometers per hour, find the quickest route the man should take, which minimizes the time to get home. So first, let's take a look at all of the options that this man can choose from. Well, one option is that he could swim the least amount of time possible, which means that he would swim directly across the river, and then as soon as he reaches the shore, then he can walk the rest of the way to his house. And this is indeed a pretty good option, since he walks so much faster than he swims. But actually, the fact of the matter is that this is not the quickest option. So let's take a look at another option he could choose from. He also can decide to take the shortest route possible, which means he would have to swim directly in a straight line, which goes straight to his house. This is a really bad option if this man chooses to go home this way because he swims so much slower than he walks that this is definitely not the quickest way the man can get home. So let's take a look at one more option this man can choose. He also can choose some point in between his house and directly across from him on the other side of the river. I'll just label some arbitrary points in the middle. He can choose to swim to this point and then walk the rest of the way once he gets ashore. And this is indeed the quickest way for the man to get to his house. But the question is, where exactly is this point on the other side of the river that the man should swim to? Well, this is where we use calculus and optimization to work out this problem. We can find exactly where this point is on the other side of the river. So first, let's take a look at all of the steps that we use in optimization. So step number one says to find the equation to maximize or minimize. So this information is usually given to us. If we go back to our example, it says find the quickest route that the man should take, which minimizes the time. So we need to minimize the time it takes for the man to get home. Well, how do we find this equation for time? Well, we know the total time this man takes to get to his house is equal to the time spent swimming plus the time spent walking. So here I wrote down the equation for time. The total time is equal to the time spent swimming, which I wrote in blue with an S subscript, which stands for swimming, plus the time spent walking, which I wrote in dark red and the W subscript stands for walking. And we know that time is equal to distance divided by speed. So the time that the man spent swimming is equal to the distance that he swam divided by the speed that the man can swim. And the same can be said for the time he spent walking. The time he spent walking is equal to the distance that the man walked divided by the speed that he can walk. So here I wrote the equation for you as well. The total time is equal to the distance that the man swam divided by the speed that he can swim plus the distance that he walked divided by the speed that he can walk. So this is the total time in terms of distance and speed. And at this point, I think we're ready to move on to step number two. So step number two says to reduce this equation to one variable. So if we go back to our example, right now our time equation is written in terms of distance and speed. And we need to reduce this equation so it's written in terms of one variable. So first, let's take a look at the distance the man swims. Now the distance the man swims is this diagonal line going across the river. And an easy way to look at it is if you make a right triangle. So I'm going to make a right triangle with the left side going across the river and the bottom side going to the point where he lands on the other side of the river. 
And we know that the left side of this triangle is equal to one kilometer because the, the river is one kilometer wide. And the bottom side of this triangle, we don't know this distance yet. So we're going to label the bottom side of this triangle a distance of x. So if we use the Pythagorean theorem, we can find this distance that he swims across the river because this is the hypotenuse of the right triangle. So the hypotenuse is equal to the square root of the left side squared, so the left side has a distance of 1, and then we have to square it, plus the distance of the other side squared, the other side has a distance of x, so we have x squared, and the square root of all of this is the distance of the hypotenuse, so this distance is equal to the square root of 1 squared plus x squared. So now, let's take a look at the distance that he walks. It's this horizontal distance from where he lands on shore all the way to his house. Well, we know this total horizontal distance is equal to 10 kilometers. And if we subtract the horizontal distance that he swims, that's equal to the, the distance that he walks. So this is equal to the total amount, 10 kilometers, minus the horizontal distance that he swims, which is x. 10 minus x is this horizontal distance that he walks. So now we are ready to rewrite our equation in terms of one variable x. So first, let's rewrite our distance that he is swimming. I'm going to erase the distance that he is swimming, and I'm going to replace it with the square root of 1 plus x squared. We know this information from our diagram. We know that he swims a distance of the square root of 1 squared, which is just 1, plus x squared. And we also know the speed in which the man can swim. This information is given to us in our problem, so I'm going to erase the speed in which he can swim, and I'm going to replace it with a 3, because we know that the man can swim at 3 kilometers per hour. This information is given to us. So now I'm going to do the same thing for the distance that the man walks. Now we know from our diagram that the man walks a distance of 10 minus x. So I can erase in our equation the distance that the man walks and I can replace it with a 10 minus x. And we also know the speed in which the man can walk because this information is given to us. So I'm going to erase the speed in which the man can walk and I'm going to replace it with a 6, because we know that the man can walk at 6 kilometers per hour. This information is given to us. So now we have completed step number 2. We wrote the equation in terms of one variable x. But before we move on to the next step, I want to simplify this equation as much as possible. So the time is equal and instead of writing the 3 in the denominator, I'm going to write it as a one-third fraction. And this is all going to be multiplied by the square root of 1 plus x squared, but instead of writing a square root, I'm going to put 1 plus x squared with a one-half exponent. And the reason why I did this is because it's easier to take the derivative later on in the problem. And I'm also going to do the same thing for this 6 that's in the denominator. I'm going to write it as a 1 -sixth fraction. And this is all being multiplied by the numerator, which is 10 minus x. So now we simplified this equation as much as possible, and we're ready to move on to step number 3. So step number 3 says to find the critical values, which means to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So if we go back to our example, we need to take the derivative of this time equation and set it equal to zero. So let's do this. The derivative of time with respect to x is equal to the derivative of the first term, which means we need to use the chain rule. So the first thing I'm going to do is multiply the one-half exponent by the one-third constant which is equal to 1 -sixth. The inside of the parentheses stays the same, 1 plus x squared. The exponent is decreased by 1, so 1 half minus 1 is equal to negative 1 half. So we have an exponent of negative 1 half. 
And with the chain rule, you always have to multiply by the derivative of the inside of the parentheses. So the derivative of 1 plus x squared is just equal to 2x. So now that we took the derivative of the first term, now let's take the derivative of the second term. Well, if we distribute this 1 6 times the 10, that's equal to 10 over 6, and the derivative of 10 over 6 is just 0. And if we distribute the 1 6 times negative x, that's equal to negative 1 6x, and the derivative of negative 1 6x is equal just to negative 1 6. So this is our derivative of the time equation with respect to x, and before we go any further, I want to simplify this as much as possible. And the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of this negative exponent. A negative, a negative exponent in the numerator is the same thing as a positive exponent in the denominator. So we can put 1 plus x squared with a positive 1 half exponent in the denominator. And remember, a 1 half exponent is the same thing as a square root. So I'm, I'm actually going to convert this to a square root as soon as possible. So we have the square root of 1 plus x squared and in the numerator, we have a positive 2x multiplied times a 1, and that's just equal to 2x. And in the, de in the denominator, we still have the 6 being multiplied. So the 6 is being multiplied by the square root of 1 plus x squared. And this can be simplified even further. Uh, notice how we have 2x over 6. 2x over 6 can be reduced to x over 3. So now I just erased the 2x over 6 and replaced it with x over 3. So now this term is simplified as much as possible, and on the right-hand side of our derivative we have negative 1 6, which, which can't be simplified, so that stays the same. So this is our derivative with respect to x, and it's simplified as much as possible. So now, in order to find the critical values, we need to take the derivative and set it equal to 0 and solve for x. So the first thing I'm going to do to solve for x is add 1 6 to both sides. So I'm going to add 1 6 to the left side and add 1 6 to the right side. And on the left side, the negative 1 6 and the positive 1 6 cancel each other out. And the only thing we're left with is x over 3 times the square root of 1 plus x squared. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we have 0 plus 1 6, which is just equal to 1 6. Now, in order to get rid of this fraction 1 6, I'm going to multiply both sides by 6. So on the right side, the 6's cancel each other out. And if we simplify this, on the left-hand side, we have 6 multiplied times x, which is just equal to 6x. And this is all over 3 times the square root of 1 plus x squared. And this is all equal to the right side. And the only thing we have left on the right side is 1. Notice on the left side we have 6x over 3. 6x over 3 can be reduced to 2x. So now I just erased the 6x over 3 and reduced it to 2x. And now we can get rid of this square root of 1 plus x squared in the denominator. So I'm going to multiply both sides by the square root of 1 plus x squared. Multiply the right side also by the square root of 1 plus x squared. And if we simplify this even further, notice on the left side, the square root of 1 plus x squared cancels out with the other square root. And the only thing we're left with on the left side is 2x. And on the right side, we have 1 times the square root of 1 plus x squared. Well, 1 times anything is just itself, so this is just the square root of 1 plus x squared. Now the next thing I want to do is get rid of this square root. So to get rid of the square root, I'm going to square both sides. So I'm going to square the left side and square the right side. And on the left side we have 2x squared, which is equal to 4x squared. And on the right side we have the square of a square root, which is just itself. So on the right side it's just 1 plus x squared. So bear with me here. I know this algebra is taking a while, but the next thing we want to do is get all of the x terms on one side of the equation. So I'm going to subtract both sides by x squared. So on the left we have 4x squared minus x squared, which is just 3x squared. 
and on the right side, the positive x squared and negative x squared cancel each other out, and the only thing we're left with is positive 1. Now to get x by itself, we can divide both sides by 3, and on the left side, the 3's cancel each other out, and the only thing we're left with is x squared, and on the right side, we have 1 over 3. So now, the last thing we need to do to get x by itself is to get rid of the squared on top of the x. So I'm going to square root both sides to get rid of the squared. And on the left hand side we have the square root of x squared, which is just x. And on the right side we have the square root of 1 over 3. And usually when you square root both sides of an equation, you need to put plus or minus the square root of 1 over 3. And the reason why I didn't do that is because x can never be a negative value. x is a distance. It has to be greater than 0. So that's why the value for x is only a positive square root of 1 over 3. So now the next thing I want to do is get an approximate value for x. So I'm going to plug the square root of 1 over 3 into a calculator. And if we do that, we get an approximate value for x of 0.577, rounded to three decimal points. And so our critical value for x is 0.577, and now we are ready to move on to step number four. So step number four says to verify if the critical value is a maximum or a minimum, or it could possibly be neither. So if we go back to our example, we need to verify if this value of 0.577 is a max or a min. Now in my other videos, I use the second derivative test to verify if the critical value was a max or a min. Now I don't recommend using the second derivative test for this particular example because the algebra is extremely extensive to find the second derivative for this example and it would take a really, really long time. So I don't recommend using the second derivative test. So we're going to use another method. We're going to assume this is a minimum. Since we're trying to find the minimum time, we need to assume that this is indeed a minimum. And then we're going to plug in other values for x just to verify that it really is uh, the minimum. So if we go back to the beginning of the problem, we're going to assume that if x is equal to 0.577, that this is going to give us the minimum time. This is the quickest way for the man to get home. So in other words, the man is going to swim across the river and he's going to arrive on the other side at a horizontal distance of 0.577 kilometers to the right. And then he's going to rock, walk the rest of the way home. And I highly encourage you to verify if this indeed is the quickest path the man should take, since we didn't use the second derivative test to verify if it really was a minimum. So we can plug in other values for x into our time equation. For example, you can plug in a value for x of 0, and if you plug in any other value for x into your time equation, you're going to get a higher value than if you plug in our critical value of 0.577. So it indeed is a minimum, and it will be the, the quickest way the man can get home. So I hope this video gave you a better idea on how to perform optimization problems. And there are many other examples which are much different, and so that's why I made four other optimization videos as well. Uh, the links for these videos are in the screen, and the description for each example that I use is in red, so you can see which example I use in the video. So thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in my next one.